People have a lot of questions about Noah's flood. Could it really have happened the way the Bible says it did? Get your questions answered and find out why it matters. This week on Creation Magazine Live. Welcome to Creation Magazine Live. My name is Richard Fangrad. And I'm Thomas Bailey. This week, our topic is Noah's Flood. The flood is the key to understanding this controversial issue of the age of the earth. And yep, we'll talk right. about that next week. Today, did the flood really happen the way it's described in the Bible? Or was it just a local flood that got exaggerated mm, over time? Yeah. Could Noah get all those animals on the ark? Where'd the water come from? We're going to address those questions and many more. But does it even matter if Noah's flood was really global? Right, yeah, one of the reasons that it does is because that's the way it's written. If we can't trust the Bible about events like Noah's flood, then can, can we trust it when it talks about other events like the birth and crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus Christ? That's a good point. But often people say it was just a local flood. Yes. Now, which one is right? Well, let's start by looking at biblical and other evidence that the flood was global. Genesis 7, 11 and 12 reads, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, on the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of the heavens were opened, and rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In verses 19 and 20 we read, And the waters prevailed so mightily on the earth that all the high mountains under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed above the mountains, covering them fifteen cubits deep. Okay, now a cubit is a distance from your elbow to the end of your hand, about 18 inches. That means the water was more than 20 feet above the mountains. Mm -hmm. How can it not be global if the tops of the mountains were covered, right? A mountain covering local flood would look something like this, right? It doesn't work. The depth of the flood waters indicates that it was global. Exactly. No wonder the text also says, and all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds, livestock, beasts, all swarming creatures that swarm on the earth, and all mankind. Only Noah was left, and those who were with him in the ark. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. 150 days. That's five months after it began. The waters abated just enough for the ark to come to rest on the mountains of Ararat. But it wasn't until the 27th day of the second month of Noah's 601st year that God told Noah to disembark. That's a year and 10 days after the flood began. Yeah. What kind of a local flood lasts a year and 10 days? The duration of the flood also indicates that it was global, not local. If this was just a local flood, we need to ask some questions. Yeah. Like when God used the rainbow as a sign of his promise in Genesis 9:15 that the waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Was he talking about a local flood? If so, then God has broken that promise thousands of times. Yes. But God doesn't break his promises. No. The rainbow covenant is another biblical evidence for a global flood. It is. Also, why did Noah need to build the ark and live on it for a year? <laughs> why not just move? Uh, why bring all those animals and even birds on the ark? Surely they could have migrated to another region. The need for the ark at all and the need for animals and the need for birds to be on the ark are three more evidences that the flood was global, not local. And finally, there are over 500 flood legends from yes. all over the world yep. that are all remarkably similar to the Noah's flood account in Genesis. Even people in remote areas like Fiji and Hawaii have an account of a global flood in their own people's history. Yeah, why? Why is that? Because all people came from Noah's family, yep. even those in Fiji and Hawaii. Does it make more sense that memories of hundreds of local floods were distorted to be accounts of global floods? or that there was one massive global catastrophe as the Bible records. Let's go with that. The flood legends are <laughs> another evidence for a global flood. Yes. The main reason people want to make it a local flood, here it is, yeah. is to allow for the millions of years needed for evolution. And let's, let's, let's explain that. Up until the late 18th century, scientists understood that most of the layers of rock full of fossils were the result of Noah's flood. Right. Then some geologists like James Hutton suggested that the layers had been formed slowly over millions of years. Hutton assumed that the present is the key to the past, which means that if we can see a process like slow and gradual sedimentation or erosion in the present, then it must have always been slow and gradual. Mm. This concept is called uniformitarianism, 
And according to that logic, the layers of rock must have taken millions of years to form, so they couldn't be evidence for Noah's flood. Yeah, Hutton and in the early 1800s, Charles Lyell were trying to apply a different history to the rock record. They were trying to sell the idea that it's not the result of a global flood, it's the result of millions of years, long ages yeah. in geology, then influenced Charles Darwin's views in biology. Ah, he thought that given millions of years, the little changes within a kind that he was seeing could add up into massive changes evolving one kind into another. See, without the millions of years, evolution doesn't work. A famous evolutionist said that the Darwinian revolution began when it became obvious that the earth was very ancient rather than having been created only 6,000 years ago. This finding was the snowball that started the whole avalanche. If the earth is young, the evolution is dead. That's right, yeah. Now, unfortunately, those in the church who've accepted the millions of years are forced to make mm. Noah's flood local, not global. If those layers are evidence for millions of years, they can't also be evidence for a global right. flood. Right? All long age interpretations of Genesis force a twisting of the text to make Noah's flood local. But as we explained in the last two episodes, Adding millions of years to the Bible puts millions of years of death before Adam sinned, right. which undermines the gospel. And when we come back, what does the evidence show? Millions of years or a global flood? Scientists studying fossil sea spiders from Jurassic Rock found they are just the same as today's sea spiders. By evolutionary reckoning, that's no change in 160 million years. In that supposed time, evolutionists say, most of the dinosaurs, birds, many fish and virtually all mammals have evolved, all by natural processes. From finches to albatrosses and mice to elephants, they all made themselves by evolutionary processes. They also say that most of the flowering plants evolved too, and yet the sea spiders haven't changed in all that time. Curious, isn't it? The Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1 that God created plants to produce seed according to each kind created, and he created sea life and creeping things after their kind also. This is the most established principle of biology, that living things produce offspring like themselves. These sea spiders illustrate this biblical truth. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. Welcome back. Today we're talking about Noah's flood. Was it really global? Yeah, skeptics claim there's no evidence for a global flood, but what evidence would we expect to find if there was one? What marks mm. would it leave that scientists could find today? We would expect huge geologic features like this. Some of the layers exposed in Grand Canyon cover thousands of square miles in the U.S. and can even be traced to England. Rapid deposition of sediments is predicted in a global flood. Yes. And scientists find things like ripple marks, raindrop marks, and animal tracks in the rocks. Things that would erode unless they got covered up quickly and preserved by more sediment. A global flood would produce a global fossil record by rapidly burying plants and animals. Yeah. Guess what? We see billions of fossils <laughs> showing little decomposition. Yeah. That means they must have been buried quickly, not yeah. slowly. It's a great time to be a Christian. Science supports scripture. It's commonly taught that it takes millions of years for a fossil to form, but animals that die and don't get buried quickly get eaten by predators or yep. they decompose. There's nothing left to fossilize. Now here's a, a fossil of a mother ichthyosaurus, like a dolphin, giving birth. Do you think it stayed in that position giving birth for years as it was slowly <laughs> buried? The mothers everywhere are cringing right oh now at the thought. Here's a fossil octopus and a jellyfish. Now, they must have been buried quickly to preserve the soft tissue before it rotted. Yes. This is exactly what's expected in a global flood. Exactly. And then there are polystrate fossils, fossils mm. that run through yeah. multiple layers of rock, like this tree in the Bay of Fundy near Joggins, Nova Scotia, Canada. If those layers took millions of years to form, that tree would have rotted. But there it is. But what about Hutton's idea that sedimentation has always been a slow process? It's an idea, yeah. When Mount St. Helens erupted in 1980, we saw that layers of sediment can form rapidly. Mm -hmm. yeah. The layer that you see there between the dotted lines, that was laid down in about three hours on June 12th, 1980. Here's a close up. Look at the fine layers. Normally one or two of those thin layers get laid down per year, but here they're within a 20 foot thick block deposited in three hours. That's some fast deposition. It is. And <laughs> it helps us understand what a global flood might be capable of on a much larger scale. Yes. 
Also, mud flows from the volcano carved a canyon through the existing layers also in a single day. The uh, river that you see in the canyon today had nothing to do with its formation. It didn't even exist before the canyon. Yeah. It's caused by the rainfall collecting in the canyon after it was formed. So instead of the river causing the canyon, the canyon caused the river. Yeah, more support for rapid deposition is seen in bent layers of mm. rock. Here's yeah. an example from Auckland, New Zealand. It's very hard to bend solid rock. <laughs> uh, if they form slowly over millions of years, there should be signs of cracking, but there aren't. Uh, a global flood is a much better cause. The layers were deposited rapidly and then bent while they were still soft. Now things have changed since Hutton. Many non-Christian geologists now admit that most of the geologic record was formed by catastrophe. Yes. But rather than admit a global flood, they say many catastrophes happened with gaps of millions of years between the layers. Yeah. Yet there's little to no evidence for gaps. Things like erosion and soil formation. They just can't let go of the millions of years. Yeah, they can't. Yeah, here's a picture from Grand Canyon. See the very straight line between those two layers? Evolutionists say there's a gap of 10 million years between those layers. Really? Then it shouldn't be that straight, right? And we would expect to see a soil zone underneath that top layer, but it's not there. This makes more sense if the layers formed quickly than over millions of years. Right. So why do they want a time gap between those layers? Hmm. Evolutionists need millions of years for evolution to occur, yeah. so they've got to put those years somewhere. And if they admit to the possibility of a global flood, then they'd have to confront the possibility that the Bible is true. Right, yeah, we wouldn't want to do that. Uh, but what about the ark? We'll talk about that in just a few minutes. Many Christians today have a diminished view of the Bible because they can't answer questions like, is there really a God? What about evolution? Are there facts to back up the Bible? Or is it all just faith? Creation Ministries expert speakers visit churches all over the world to help pastors equip their congregations to understand that the whole Bible, even Genesis, is accurate. We help to demolish the arguments that the world uses to try to convince people that the Bible isn't true. For more information on getting a CMI speaker to visit your church, contact your nearest CMI office through our website. Welcome back to more about Noah's Flood. We've looked at evidence for a global flood in geology, but what about the ark? Mm -hmm. Now, you may have seen pictures of the ark that look like this. It makes it look like the ark was incredibly crowded. Well, no wonder skeptics say that Noah couldn't possibly have fit all the animals on that little ark. Well, yeah, not that one. It's as adorable as it is. It's not biblically accurate. And here are the dimensions God gave Noah in Genesis 6, 15 and 16. Mm -hmm. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits, its breadth, 50 cubits, and its height, 30 cubits. Remember the cubit? To translate, the ark was about 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. It was big. Now, this picture gives you a better idea of how massive it really was. Of course, skeptics will still say there's no way Noah could have fit two of each of millions of species on the ark. Yeah, but Noah didn't need to take two of every species alive right. today. Genesis 6 verse 20 says, Of the birds according to their kinds, and of the animals according to their kinds, of every creeping thing on the ground according to its kind, two of every sort shall come to you to keep them alive. Now the word kind here refers to a much larger group than species. For example, the canine kind would include dogs and wolves and coyotes, right. etc variations that arose after the flood by way of both natural and artificial selection. And we'll talk about that more in a few weeks in episode six. Also in Genesis 7:22, we read, everything on the dry land in whose nostrils was the breath of life died. Now this doesn't include insects because they breathe through the tiny pores in their skeletons, not nostrils. Yeah. And they could have survived on floating mats of ripped up tangled vegetation. Yeah, no, no fish either. Uh, <laughs> now, many did get buried, but clearly some survived. ARC researcher John Wood Morapi estimates that there were about 8,000 created kinds on the ARC, so 16,000 individual animals, plus a few more of the ceremonially clean animals. The overall volume of the ARC is over 500 railroad stock cars. Wood Morapi calculated the average size of all the animals that would have been about the size of a sheep. And even in cages, 16,000 sheep-sized animals would only take up about a third of the floor space. And newer calculations indicate an average size closer to the size of a rat, 
so even less space would be needed. Yeah, the food and water needed would take up only about a 25% of the ARC's volume. That leaves plenty of room for badminton court, go-kart track, swimming pool, actually for hundreds of people, but only eight heeded the warning that judgment was coming. Many objections about the feasibility of the ark have been answered after a careful reading of scripture and some yeah. arithmetic and, and just thinking about solutions. When we come back, where did all that water come from and where did it go? When most people hear the word explosion, they often think of destroyed buildings and injured people. But geologists have long recognised a different type of explosion in Earth's sedimentary rocks, known as the Cambrian explosion. Cambrian rocks are a group of rocks found around the world in which we find fossils of many of the major animal groups. This is significant because pre-Cambrian rocks found below the Cambrian don't generally contain much fossil material. But then in the Cambrian, there are fossils in abundance. In fact, this transition is so dramatic that some call it the Cambrian Big Bang. But probably the most devastating impact of the Cambrian explosion is the damage it does to evolutionary ideas, even with evolutionary dating notions. Since most major animal groups appeared suddenly in the fossil record without ancestors, the idea that all life evolved slowly over time becomes very hard to swallow. To find out more from Creation Ministries International, visit our website, creation.com. And we've been talking about various aspects of Noah's flood, mm -hmm. its global scale, evidence in geology, and the size and stability of the ark. Now let's talk about all that water. Where did it come from and where did it go? In Genesis 7, 11 and 12, uh, we read, All the fountains of the great deep burst forth, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the rain fell upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Wow. So we have two sources of water there. One of them is the great deep. Now in the Bible and scripture, this often refers to oceans, but it could also refer to subterranean water, for example. Now the term burst forth suggests that water may have been released through large fissures in the ground or the ocean floor. Now this may have included a, a series of volcanic eruptions, which often release a lot of water. Yeah, what about the oceans themselves? Well, there are several mm. flood models, but the one we feel is, is kind of the current leader of the pack is catastrophic plate tectonics, CPT. Yeah. Many lines of evidence indicate that the continents have moved apart, causing new ocean floor to be formed from hot mantle material. Now, originally proposed by creationist Antonio Snyder back in 1859, as and he thought it took place during the flood. Now, the millions of years folks have applied their timescale to it, and that's the version yeah. that most of us have been taught. However, Dr. John Baumgartner, the world's leading geophysicist in modeling plate tectonics, used supercomputers and concluded that it could happen rapidly. In Baumgartner's model, one tectonic plate would begin to sink underneath an adjacent plate. He discovered that a breakdown in friction would cause those plates to sink very fast meters per second sort of speeds. Yeah. This caused the original continent to be ripped apart, allowing hot mantle material to form new ocean floor. But the hotter, less dense ocean floor would be perhaps 2,000 meters higher than the existing ocean floor, pushing the seawater up onto the continent. Instant global flood. <laughs> it would also vaporize a massive amount of water, producing intense global rainfall. Yeah, the windows of heaven. Yeah. Now, skeptics will often say there couldn't possibly be enough water to flood the whole earth and cover up the mountains and yeah. especially and Mount Everest, way. the highest point on earth. Mm -hmm. But Everest is a post-flood mountain. There are marine fossils at the summit of Everest. Yeah. Everest was formed late in the flood as the Indian tectonic plate smashed into the Asian plate. Toward the end of the flood, as the new ocean floor cooled, it would sink into the mantle, forming deep ocean basins giving the water a place to run to off the continents. Yeah, now, by the way, today, the, if, if the continents were lowered and the ocean floor raised so that everything was at the same level, there's enough water in the oceans right now for a global flood of about 2.7 kilometers. Wow. And about 70% of the Earth's surface is covered with water. <laughs> when we come back, we're gonna talk about a post-flood ice age and some other things. For a more in-depth understanding of topics relating to the creation-evolution debate, the Journal of Creation contains peer-reviewed research papers that support the biblical account of creation, the flood, and the fall. One subscriber said, I always assumed that this journal would be too academic for me. 
Not so. I am a Christian with a very inquiring mind. With each issue, I find powerful articles that open doors and shine light on my understanding of the world. Each journal of creation is more than 120 pages and published three times a year. To subscribe, visit creation.com. Welcome back. We've been addressing a number of questions about Noah's flood. Another question that often comes up is, how did the animals get to places like Australia? Mm -hmm. There's lots of water in between uh, there and the Middle East where the <laughs> ark landed. Yes. Another question that, that we just kind of provided the answer for is, well, how did they get to the ark in the first place? Right, yeah. Now, from Genesis 6.20, we see that Noah didn't have to go on worldwide safari hunting down the, the animal passengers for the ark there. God sent the animals to the ark. With, with a single continent before the flood, that makes it fairly straightforward. Now, the notion of a single original continent came from Genesis 1.9, and God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place, and let dry land appear, and it was so. And it was, it was understood long ago that if the water was gathered to one place, then the land would be in one place too. That's where that idea came from. That makes sense. For all we know, kangaroos could have been living right in Noah's backyard. True. But how do we explain them traveling across, across oceans after the flood? <laughs> Did they swim? <laughs> well, no, but uh, they may have floated on log mats or rafts made of the massive amount of uprooted vegetation mm -hmm. in the flood. Uh, some rafts would also be formed uh, by pumice due to volcanic activities this mm. can, that can float on the okay. water. And these can last a, a pretty long time. And in both cases, animals could potentially ride quite a distance, you know, and the, the, the wind blows at one place and the animals get on and get off, and the wind changes, it blows it somewhere else, animals get on and get off. That kind of, it makes sense. And then there's the Ice Age. The Ice Age, yes, okay. Uh, so Thomas, is there a connection between the flood and the Ice Age? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> For an ice age to occur, you need warm oceans and cold land masses, particularly in the summer. Warm oceans evaporate a lot of water, which then comes down on cold continents as snow. Cool summers prevent the snow from completely thawing, causing ice sheets to grow over many years to be several kilometers thick. Yes. With all the tectonic activity during Noah's flood, new ocean floors being made from the hot rock, this would have caused warm oceans at the end of the flood. Volcanic dust and other aerosols from massive volcanic activity during the flood would have caused the sun's rays to bounce back, resulting in cold continents, even in the summertime. So there's the connection between the flood and the Ice Age. Ah, very good, okay. Meanwhile, evolutionary history has, has Ice Ages over billions of years, but the evidence really shows just one, there's good evidence mm, for one, yeah. Slow and gradual processes have problems explaining an ice age. If you slowly cool down the whole earth, by the time everything's cold enough for an ice age in the, in the summertime, the snow stays there in the summertime, most of it, the oceans would be too cool to produce the, the amount of precipitation needed. Problem. So a global flood, once again, is the superior explanation for an ice age. But let's explain, explain that bit about the kangaroos. Meteorologist Michael Ord estimated it would have taken about 700 years for the oceans to cool down from about 30 degrees Celsius to today's average of 4 degrees. Okay. Now, he estimates the Ice Age reached its peak about 500 years after the flood, and then the ice sheets receded over the next 200 years. Okay, but what about those kangaroos? Let's... Almost there. <laughs> this map shows the extent of the ice sheets at the peak of the Ice Age. The amount of evaporation needed to form those ice sheets would lower ocean levels by nearly 400 feet, enough for land bridges between the continents to be exposed. During the post-flood ice age, animals and people could have migrated all over the globe. Okay, all right. Then as the ice sheets melted and receded, ocean levels would rise again, making the land bridges disappear. Exactly. By that time, there could have been plenty of animals living in places like Australia. Changing climate conditions may have caused some animals to, to thrive better in some environments better than others, which might explain why kangaroos appear to be native only to Australia. It's not because they evolved there, it's because they migrated there and then got surrounded by water. Yeah, there's evidence that kangaroos used to live in other parts of the world, but it's been suggested that, see, even, even today in Australia, the kangaroo has no natural predator. So maybe elsewhere they just died out. That's right, yeah. 
And today we've, we've covered a lot of questions that people have about Noah's flood. And, and yes, it really was a world covering flood. Mm -hmm. The Bible's crystal clear yeah. on that. Yes, the geologic record has the features we would mm -hmm. expect if there was a global flood. Yes, fossils, paleontology has the evidence expected if the flood happened. The flood is the key to understanding Earth's history. And the implications of the reality of a global flood are huge as well. Consider that if the flood produced the rock record, then it wasn't formed over millions of years, right? Right. Well, therefore, it can't be used as evidence for the millions of years for evolutionary history. Yeah. Yet geology is most often the go-to science that evolutionists use to prop up their version of history. Yeah, and if, if scientists find rocks there that they use for radiometric dating and that kind of thing, right. if the radiometric dating comes out to millions of years, well, instantly little red flags should go up and say, wait, wait a minute, those rocks were formed during Noah's flood about 4,400 years ago, right. so how come this dating method is giving these results? It should make us question that dating method. That's right, yep. that's right. And, and also consider that the flood was God's judgment on sin. Mm. And, and God has said, there's another global judgment coming. Now the last one was by water, the next one is by, most of you know, by fire. By fire. And as it was in the days of Noah, God has a rescue plan for all of those who heed the warning that their rebellion against him won't be tolerated forever. Yes. Jesus, describing himself within the analogy of a shepherd, goes on to say, I am the door. Yeah. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Jesus stands in the gate protecting the sheep. Yep. Just like that door on Noah's ark protected, well, the people who were inside, the animals, protected them from the flood waters. That's right, yeah. Uh, it's, it's the same way that people needed to go through the literal door of the ark to be saved yep. about 4,400 years ago. Today, we all need to go through the, the figurative door of Christ to be saved. Turn to Christ. That's the answer. And that's ultimately what CMI is all about anyways. Right. It's, yes, we have scientists and we're doing science and this episode was on Noah's flood and the right. evidence for it and so on, geology, fossils and that kind of thing, wonderful stuff. But it's a means to an end. It's yeah. a means to an end. The end is what's important. It's showing you and everyone in the world that the Bible can be trusted and not just in creation evolution. That's our focus as a ministry right. yep. because that's a very attacked area of the Bible, isn't it? Absolutely. It's very attacked. But even that area is true. But more than that, the end goal is the Bible is true where it talks about what God did to save sinners. That's right. So that's, that's right. That's and, the key. and face it, we all know that when we try to witness to somebody, uh, somebody will have an objection that has something to do with Noah's flood. And they say, well, you can't, yep. you can't trust that part of it. So how do I know that the gospel of Jesus is true? Yeah, we've heard those. <laughs> yeah. So join us next week when we explore the age of the earth. And don't forget that Christianity is an evidence-based faith. And science supports scripture.